Good morning. And welcome to worship inside. Um, some of you maybe were expecting that we would be outside. Um, we received a report that the air quality wasn't its best, so we wanted to make sure we could breathe easily inside here in the sanctuary. You may have also noticed a couple changes in the sanctuary. We have some new flooring, and that's still in the process, so up in the choir loft, still in the process. We're almost through with that process, but we're very happy with the way it looks, um, so let's celebrate that today. As we worship, as we gather together for worship, we give thanks to God for this community gathered here, for all those who are gathered here in person and online. We give thanks for the spirit who is already at work in each and every one of us, and we pray that Christ's presence would be made known to us in our worship today. Everything that you need for worship today is printed on your bulletins or on the screen, so we've really got you covered. In your bulletins, you'll find announcements about our life together in the church, as well as opportunities to serve. You should have received on your way into the sanctuary today a heart that looks like this, so if you need a heart, uh, raise your hand and we'll get you a heart. Um, that'll be a, a surprise part of our service today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we also, uh, we invite you to fill out the connection sheet to let us know how we can care for you and how you would like to care for others in this community. If you have not had the chance to sign up yet for God's Work Our Hands Sunday on September 10th, we urge you to sign up today. Uh, we have eight service and learning projects in our community. You can sign up on the sheets in your bulletins and place it in the offering plate. We ask you to mark your top three service projects in order of preference. And um, Pastor Katie, can you pass me that shirt there? If you don't have one of these fine looking yellow shirts and you are planning on serving in God's Work Our Hands <laughs> Sunday, we have these shirts in the fellowship hall um, and you can pick one up today and then bring it back and wear it on God's Work Our Hands Sunday. A few more announcements. As we prepare for the fall season of Sunday School, we're going to be having a kickoff meeting on September 10th at 9.30 between the services. All families with children preschool through 12th grade are invited for the kickoff meeting. We're gonna have Sunday School registration, games, and more information about plans for the fall, opportunities to connect um, through the church. Our fall worship hours will be beginning after Labor Day on September 10th. Traditional worship will begin at 8.15, and contemporary worship will begin at 10.45, with a faith formation hour between the services at 9.30. Pastor Joel is running again in the Faster Pastors Relay. This year, the money uh, that is raised will go to support Cristo Rey Lutheran Church in El Paso, Texas. Crystal Ray is doing really important work at the border um, to receive and care for refugees and educate, educate congregations through their border immersion program. I had the opportunity to participate in this program in May, and so I'd, I'd be happy to talk about my experience after the service with anyone who has questions. I encourage you to, import, to support this important ministry of our church and synod. And finally, thank you to everyone who donated to help Tyne Clammer re reach her fundraising goal, which she has. Um, if you would still like to contribute to the effort to advocate for policies addressing global poverty, there's more information in your bulletins. I think that's all of our announcements for today. I invite you to stand as you are able as we prepare our hearts for worship Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy, Christ. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace through Let us pray. 
let us pray. We offer our thanks and praise to you, O God, for in your son Jesus you have fulfilled your law and revealed your desire to reconcile all people to yourself and to one another. Form us into the body of your son that we may put on the armor of light and be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we live and move and find our being. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and I invite the kids to come forward for Kids in Christ with Anita. We kind of rearranged, so can you come over here? Because we're going to be over here. <laughs> and dude, you're like in the spotlight because we have all these people and one kid. <laughs> Pressure's on. We're down here, so not everybody's looking at you, okay? They, they, they can't see us. It's just, it'll just be you and me, okay? <laughs> so, I'm going to tell you something about me. I used to be a teacher. And one thing students would ask me is, Mrs. Steele, is that going to be on the test? Because they wanted to know what things were important and what Maybe they could get by without worrying about. Now, as a teacher, I kind of thought pretty much everything I was teaching them was important or I wouldn't have taken the time to teach them. So you might want to keep that in mind if you ever attempted to ask that question of a teacher. Now, in today's scripture reading, you're going to hear a small part of a letter written by a guy named Paul, which was written to a group of believers in a city called Rome. Now, these people had a lot of questions about what it was to be a follower of Jesus. Because following Jesus was really different than following the gods of the ancient Near East. What did they need to do and not do? What are the rules of the house? After all, because they love Jesus, so they want to do things his way. So what's important? Kind of like, you know, when we're students and we want to know what's on the test. So in this part of the letter... Paul reminds the Romans and us that at the base of everything, Jesus wants us to love. And Jesus even said that when he was on, here on earth, that loving God and loving others is the foundation for everything that they called back then the law and the prophets, which was most of their Bible at the time. And Paul's reminding them and us of this. Love. That sounds kind of easy, doesn't it? Well, in some ways, but that also means that we have to be truly motivated from our hearts. When we aren't sure what to do in a situation, we have to think, what's the loving thing to do? Like, what about that kid no one wants to sit with at lunch? What would the loving thing to do be? Or when our friends say something not nice about someone. It can also be as simple as remembering to smile and thank the bus driver. Letting someone else go ahead of you in the hallway and not thinking bad stuff about them. <laughs> Choosing not to get mad if someone cuts in line at the water fountain. Love's a hard thing that we get to practice every day over and over. It's not a neat checklist that we can just check off and say, okay, we're done with that. Test is over. Jesus wants us to be his image bearers, which sounds kind of fancy, but that means that we show the world what he's like. And one very important way we do that is by doing in everything we do with love, because that's what he did. God loves you so very, very much, and when we remember that, we let his love overflow into our hearts and onto others, and then we're doing things in love. So today in sacred space, you can take one of these nifty hearts that hopefully you got when you walked in, and if not, they have them out there. And it's got a little clock here, and it's going to be like time to love our neighbor. And we can set a time to focus on God's love every day. What can we do to show love? And you can kind of think about that. 
because each day we can find a way to show love to another person. It doesn't have to be big and fancy. It can be even the little things, which is kind of cool. So can you pray with me? We offer our thanks and praise to you. O oh God, for in your Son, Jesus, you have fulfilled your law and revealed your desire to reconcile all people to yourself and one another. Form us into the body of your Son. That we may put on the armor of light and be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we live and move and find our being. And all God's people said, Amen. Do you have one of these? You did get one? Okay, because I was going to give you mine if you didn't. And who's doing the memory verse? It's right up here on the board. I didn't cover it this week because I figured we've learned it all. So now we're ready to practice it all. You ready, Zach? Okay. All right. We're going to say, this is my favorite one, love. And we'll get that twice. So love does no wrong <laughs> to a neighbor. Therefore, back to love. Love is the fulfilling of the law. The most important part is the words, and the signs are there to help us learn it. So, do you want to try that one more time? We're going to get all the words. Are we going to get all the words? Yes. Okay, big loud voice. Let's do it. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Very good. All right, thank you so much. Do you need a Band-Aid? You good? Okay, you can go back to your seat. Good morning. Our reading today comes from Romans chapter 13. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not kill, commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in rebelling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, 
not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Word of God, word of life. Friends, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there's this old Latin phrase, vestus virum facet, and it is translated literally, clothes make the man. We could say man or woman, clothes make the person. Maybe you've heard this before all through, throughout time. This phrase has earned as much criticism as it has understanding. Clothes make the person. It's an acknowledgement that, that the way that we dress can influence how others perceive us. And there's some truth to that. Studies have shown that right or wrong, people make snap judgments about, about another person based on their appearances. One, ex one study found that people were who were dressed in more formal clothes were more likely to be seen as competent and trustworthy and th than those who were dressed in more informal clothes. Clothes make the person. It's not a new judgment. It's a phrase that goes as far back as Homer in the 7th or 8th century when he wrote something like that in, in the Odyssey. And since then, it's been quoted throughout history. Quintilian, a Roman educator in the first century in Rome, Erasmus, a theologian and philosopher in the 16th century, and not long after him, Shakespeare wrote something about it in Hamlet, and Mark Twain, known for wearing his signature white suits, wrote about it in a short story called The Tsar's Soliloquy. Soliloquy. Clothes make the man or the person. It's been a common perception for thousands of years. Now, of course, clothes don't tell the whole story about a person. As often as that quote shows up in literary history, there is also critical commentary against such a judgment, that we should not be so quick to judge others based on outward appearances. You all know this. We, we try to teach our kids this. We try to share that with each other. But maybe Paul knew how quick we are, how quick humanity is to judge each other by outward appearances when he wrote what we heard today, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh that wants to gratify its desires. With that short little statement, Paul is turning our tendency for external judgment upside down by saying, it does not matter what you wear. It does not matter how, what your outward appearances are. It doesn't matter whether you're wearing uh, rags or million-dollar suits or anywhere in between. But if you are wearing million-dollar suits, I want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what matters really is that you are clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is not your own doing. This is completely God alone. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ uses the same language, the same imagery of, of getting dressed in the morning. Can you imagine how the world might be different if every decision, every action that we make, how, how my, those might be, be different if we imagined ourselves clothed with Jesus everywhere we went, every minute of every day. I think this is what Paul means when he writes, it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. Now for myself, I know that if I take the time to prepare myself each day, wake up, as, as Paul writes, with a reminder that I am clothed in Christ, my day will go much more positively. 
even should bad things happen to me. If I begin my day with a prayer, no matter how complex or how simple it might be, I am clothing myself in Christ. Even just a word to God saying, thank you for the day that you have given me. Thank you, God, for the very air that I breathe. Or perhaps it's those words that, that many of you know so well from Psalm 118. In fact, I'll invite you to say it with me. The second part at least, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, I'm so glad when people know what I'm what I mean for you to say, right? These, this is, if we say words like this each and every day and we're able to be intentional about the start of our day, this is just a, a little bit, I think, of what Paul means when he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or I might begin my day giving thanks to God for the gift of baptism, just as the scriptures connect the image of being clothed in Christ as an image for baptism. And just as, I don't know how many of you know this, the reason that we sometimes wear these white robes in worship, is this is a sign, a symbol of our baptism, that I am clothed in Christ. You can imagine that whether a person in baptism is completely submerged in water or whether they are just sprinkled with a small amount of water. The amount of water doesn't, doesn't matter as much as it is that you can imagine in baptism what is happening is that the word of God covers them as if they are, and not as if, but that because they are bathed completely in the promise of God, that they are claimed by God, that they are loved by God, they are clothed in Christ. You are clothed in Christ. And just as my day might be different and maybe a little bit more positive each day, if I take that intentional moment at the beginning of the day to remember that, that promise, that is my challenge for you this week and in the coming weeks. Find some way each and every day to recognize and to give thanks that you have been clothed in Christ. No matter how complicated or simple it may be, whether it's a 30-minute exercise of reading the Bible or a 30-second acknowledgement that God has gifted you this day, find some way to recognize that you have been clothed with Christ. And if you do this, I would love to hear a report back on how this affects your day. You are clothed in Christ. You have put on Christ. And while the act of remembering this promise might be up to you, the act of clothed, being clothed in Christ is not. This is God's doing. And whether you know it or remember it, it is still true. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the promise of the word that fills us and brings us to life, God has clothed us with Christ. You have the promise of new life, both in this world and in the next. When Paul writes, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers, sometimes people hear this and, and think that Paul is talking about the end of the world, the end of time. But this is Paul's acknowledgement that when God chose to put on flesh in the person of, of Jesus Christ, so we also put on Christ in our own flesh. So what does this mean? What does it mean to put on Christ? It's not as much a moral statement, though a lot of times I think people hear it that way. It's not as much a moral statement as, as if when we put on Christ, we're always going to be better people, making better decisions, always thinking about how we can love and serve our neighbor in all circumstances. If it were up to that, then I think we might be doomed, right? Because we all mean best. We all try. I hope it is the case that this will affect each and every day and every minute of our lives. But I also know that how quickly our good intentions can, can lead us down the wrong path. Not towards the care of our neighbors, but, but so often right back to the care and concern of ourselves. 
This is what it means to be human and bondage to sin. But putting on Christ is a promise that no matter what we do, no matter how we behave or who we are in each of us, Christ has fulfilled the law. Putting on Christ, it's, it's not just putting on Christ-likeness or following Jesus' ex example. Putting on Christ is putting on Christ fully and being brought into the new life that God gives us through the gift of the Holy Spirit, living fully into God's love. And this is Paul's best example, best attempt to help us see that, that everything that God has done, every word God has given us, every law, all of this can all be summarized with one word, and that word is love. And this love, God's love. It's, it's more than a feeling from Jesus. And the whole biblical example of this love is that it is a command. In John's gospel account, Jesus says, just as I have loved you, you also must love one another. And so then in today's reading from Romans, Paul follows this same, these same words from Jesus and twice in just a matter of three verses, twice, Paul says, love is the fulfilling of the law. You probably know this by now, but, you know, if, if somebody, if Paul were to write something twice in just three verses, it is an exclamation mark. Pay attention to this. This is important. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And he, when he says the law has been fulfilled, he's not just saying that God's law is not important or that God's law has been abolished. In fact, just the opposite. Jesus fulfilled God's law in us because that law is what shapes us as people of God. That law is what shapes our communities of faith that are gathered by God's Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me grab some water here. They said the air quality was bad. I didn't believe it, but I looked it up. It's true. <clears throat> Maybe you're feeling it. So this law is what shapes us as individuals, and it shapes our community of faith. So in today's scripture, Paul quotes some of the commandments from the Ten Commandments. And, and these, the ones he quotes are the ones that refer to, to our relationships to one another, from people to people. And then he says, all of these commandments are summed up in this word, and that is, love your neighbor as yourself. Because he knows that for ages, people have tried to find loopholes in God's law. People don't understand God's law, or maybe they forget God's law. Or as Jesus so often showed the Pharisees throughout the Gospels, they become so focused on living the letter by the letter of the law that they've missed the purpose of God's law. That every law and every work, word from God is about love. God's law is meant to shape us as individuals who look at love as something that is owed to all people simply because they are created by God. God's law is meant to shape communities of faith, to live into this law, the law of love, and help us to be accountable to it in community together. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ so that this law of love and thereby every other law from God might be fulfilled in you. Now, does putting on Christ mean that we will never sin? That every single action we do will show love for our neighbor? Of course it doesn't. We're still human. We're still weak against the power of sin. But putting on Christ each and every day helps us to wake from sleep, to lay aside the, the works of darkness as best we can. And when we cannot, putting on Christ, being clothed with Christ, allows us to live into this promise of forgiveness that comes from God, both with God and 
with one another. Being clothed in Christ reminds us that we are forgiven and loved children of God. And this love, this forgiveness starts with God. This love is the same love that launched creation and formed the human race. This love brought heaven to earth in the life of Jesus. This love led him to accept death on the cross, and this love burst forth from the tomb to usher new life into the world. And then finally, it was this love that was poured out from Jesus onto his disciples and followers even today. And it continues to be poured out from our lives to all the world around us. This, this, my friends, is grace at work in the world. This is God's love at work within us. And this love will both challenge us and it will free us. We will be freed not to worry about whether we've done enough to be loved by God and free instead to put on Christ to love our neighbors, to love our friends, to love even our enemies, those we might not agree with completely. Today, friends in Christ, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine each day or each step of your day whenever you transition that Christ has fully formed you and you are clothed in his love. He who gives you a love so strong that he died for you and raised you to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as part of this, this exercise, um, can, I borrow, can I borrow your heart real quick? Thanks, Katie. <laughs> I, I set mine down. I don't know where I put it. So uh, hopefully each of you received uh, these hearts. If not, we have them at the, the entrance of the, the sanctuary. But it says time to love your neighbor. And you can, you can put a time in there at whatever time I will focus on God's love. And then it even asks you, what will you do at this time to show God's love to one another? Um, this this is kind of a free-for-all. You can choose how to use this, but we'd love for you to go out, and you can hold on to this as a reminder, to go out with some ideas of how you will love your neighbor or how you will put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it can be a specific time, or um, some of you know, uh, not uh, last Advent, actually, I started doing another social media app called uh, Be Real, and it is a random time at each day, at each point of the day. It's kind of a cool thing. You can, you can put it on your phone, and then its purpose is not how I use it. But uh, it, 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 at a, any particular time of the day, then it forces me to think about, how do I see God in my neighbor? How will I love my neighbor? So, so go out with this. Write some notes on it. Keep this somewhere where you'll see it. And as a, as a reminder for you to love your neighbor and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We also enter into this time as we, as we sing and as we pray together. I invite you to, if you'd like, you can stay right where, you're, where you are and sing. But if you also have prayers that you want to lift up to God, whether they're prayers of, of thanksgiving or prayers of concern, there are other hearts up here in a glass jar at this ta table, and you can write those prayers down. And um, just leave them at the table. Hopefully you've seen out here on 16th Street, we have a prayer rope that is strung up between two trees. And folks all from a na neighborhood and the community and from this church uh, have been adding their prayers uh, to those ropes. And so we'll take those out for you later on if you want to leave prayers for us, for God. So now we enter into this time of sacred space.
We continue our worship giving thanks to God's presence in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and professing our faith in the faith of the whole Christian church with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, you know, saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, for creation, for all the needs of our neighbors. Let us pray. Awaken your church, O God, to your grace and to your endless love. Clothe us in Christ that we may lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light to shine your love into the world. Treating others with compassion and respect, settling differences with love and integrity, and all bound together by your love. Open our hearts to see one another as you see them and to respond with your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. O oh God, you have clothed your creation with beauty and splendor. Give us wisdom to care for all that you have made. Renew the seas and the soil, the forests and the creatures that live in them. Turn us to the ways of living that seek earth's thriving, and toward caring for those who are in the path of natural disasters. Today, especially, we remember before you those in Hawaii who are recovering from wildfires, for those on the coasts facing hurricanes and tropical storms. God of grace, hear our prayer. Inspire us all to lead with honor, O oh God. Guide leaders all around the world with justice, your justice, and help them to put on Christ, to live your law of love. We pray for those in Ukraine and wherever people face ongoing war and violence and abuse. God of grace, hear our prayer. Help us to comfort those who suffer. O oh God, bring peace and healing to all who are vulnerable, frightened, despairing, or sick. Especially this, this day, we lift up to you Carol Schultz after multiple falls and as she's been uh, admitted to the hospital just this morning. For Annette, Joanne Sterkel's sister-in-law. For Brenda, recovering after foot, foot surgery. And for those concerns that we have listed in our bulletin as we pray for Eric, Spencer, for Gwen Boswell's sister-in-law, and Sandy Bilstad's father, for Tracy, Trent, Jan, Elaine, Becky. For those who are struggling with cancer, as we lift up Mike, Rosemary, Pam, Flo, Jim, Scott, Carolyn, and Marjorie. And God, hear our prayers as we lift up to you those who are closest to us at this time, either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Guard their, weak, their waking and their sleeping and bring them to health. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
We give you thanks for the gift of baptism, O God, especially for those who celebrate baptismal birthdays this week. Those in this community, Marshall Wolf, Chieko Poppy, Jan Enertson, Jana West, Norma Dimmitt, and Gunnell Orestio. Help us each day to put on Christ and be clothed in your love. God of grace, hear our prayer. Remember us, O God, according to your steadfast love, as we offer those, these and the prayers of our hearts, trusting in your compassion that's made known to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another and with those who join us online as we wave to the camera. Peace be with you. Please join me in the offering prayer. Generous God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have shown us what it means to love, and you've called us to follow your example, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, to offer our lives and our resources in your service. Accept the gifts we bring today. May they help to share the love we have received with the world around us. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, 
and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. United into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We begin by communing those who are gathered online and those who will be remaining in their seats to receive this gift. If you are in the sanctuary here and you have not received a communion kit but you would like one to receive in your seat, can you please raise your hand so the ushers can get one, uh, one of those kits to you? As you take the bread, hear this promise for you. The body of Christ is given for you. And as you drink from the cup, hear this promise. The blood of Christ is shed for you. Amen. Now I'd like to invite forward those who are assisting with communion today.
Will you please stand as you are able? The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We are almost to the end of our service, and so after the service, I invite you um, to stay and enjoy coffee and conversation, have some fellowship time. I just wanted to give an announcement, a reminder that after the second service today, we'll be having our confirmation kickoff, so um, that's any of our middle school families. We're excited to be starting off a new year um, of confirmation from noon to two today, right here at Zion. And now I get to give my favorite announcement of all, the blessing. This blessing comes from God. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.
Go in peace, live God's love in the world. Thanks be to God.